Maggie. Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ferda. I'm the CEO for the National Cyber Security Center here in Color Springs, and I will explain a little bit about what the NCC is. What I think we're going to do today, uh, one thing, so we have a training. This, the, what you are going to get today is a training that we actually do for CEOs, boards of directors, general staff, things like that. The two areas of training that we look at are um, kind of socially engineered attacks, like how how does it happen? Because a lot of people just don't understand how does somebody get my email and find me and things like that. And then we're really going to go into kind of cyber hygiene, do's and don'ts. How to, it's not teaching you how to be an you know a, a cyber guru. Really, what it's doing is teaching you how to be a good cyber citizen. And then what we're going to do because of the audience. Anything that I talk about where there are jobs related to said cyber topic, whatever we're talking about, I will mention that so that we can have a conversation about the jobs that exist, the internships that exist, and things like that, so that you guys can have conversations with your students. Exactly. So uh, before we do that, I would love it if we could. So I know there's Mark's. Mm -hmm. Smart. Hi. Hi, Mark. <laughs> um, He's not moved. If, uh, if, if you guys can just let me know your name and you know where you work and if you're here at any, what is your role? Okay, yeah, my name is Daniel Rodriguez and I'm an admissions. Okay, for any. For any. Got it. I'm Amy Peterman and I'm an admissions person. Okay. I'm Tyler and I'm an admissions person. Okay. Angie, admissions. Okay. Taylor, admissions as well. Okay. They <laughs> stick together. crazy word called cyber and I always tell people cyber is the wild yeah. wild west right now it is moving so fast it is the Oklahoma gold rush meets the the land grab or Oklahoma land grab meets the gold rush I mean it's just it's moving so fast and it's a wild wild west people are making up the rules as they go so Hickenlooper basically came back to the state of Colorado and said by golly gee whiz I'm gonna start one of those in the state of Colorado it was absolutely supported by our Mayor Southers here in Color Springs. A lot of people say, you know, why why Color Springs? Multiple military bases that are here, and I know a ton of your students are, you know, they're, they're ex-military, which is awesome. Great universities and colleges. And then we already have multiple cyber companies in Colorado Springs and the state of Colorado. So, I mean, we really are kind of a perfect fit for the NCC to be here. We are a 501 C3, so we are a non-profit organization. We are not funded by the government. We are not funded by um, any academic institutions. Uh, we, are, we are a non-profit, which right now is a little bit of a struggle. Uh, November 1st is our one year anniversary of having a board of directors and a CEO and all that good stuff. So we're not even a year old yet. So right now, those, those funds are hard. In five years, I'm probably gonna say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that we're a 501 C3 and we're not under the governor's office. And, and things like that, but right now it's, it's tough. So what do we exist for? We exist for cyber workforce development, and this is something we, we're gonna share some data at the end of this about the cyber jobs that are available and, and just what's going on from a workforce development standpoint. Cyber economic development, helping, helping companies survive and thrive in this cyber universe, and then cyber security for all. So really those that's kind of what we are, and it's really building this ecosystem where cyber can, can bloom and, you know, entrepreneurial and new companies can bloom and grow. Uh, who is the NCC? So we have a three-legged stool where Exponential Impact, which is an accelerator, really focuses on cyber jobs, cyber creation, and cyber human potential. We also have the Cyber Research Education and Training Center, powered by UCCS. UCCS is a major, major partner 
with us from a, a research and education standpoint. Hi, Ms. Mary. She's Mary's with me. Hi. Hi. Uh, then we have the Cyber Institute, which is essentially a think tank. So anything policy, legislation, law, anything like that will come out of this Cyber Institute. This is also where we do these cybersecurity oversight trainings. And again, these oversight trainings, we're gonna, there's gonna be certain trainings that are geared specifically to CEOs, certain ones that are geared to boards of directors, certain ones that are geared to elected officials, certain ones that are geared to just general staff, things like that. So that's kind of who the NCC is. Here, you can sit down. No, that's my seat. <laughs> okay, so that's who the NCC is. So now when we're going into cyber hygiene, and we're talking about kind of how do you protect yourself on the, uh, you know, out, out in the web and out in cyber. It really is, and this is going to be my, my foundation of my, my entire talk. It is finding a balancing act between convenience and security and safety. And that's really all it is. So every time there's a new widget that comes out, the first thing from a cybersecurity standpoint is you're thinking is like, okay, what's the underbelly of that? So it truly is balancing convenience with security and safety. And I will tell you, there are going to be some things when we go into the cyber hygiene aspect of this, there are going to be some things that you guys are going to be like, really, Jen? Like, you're telling me not to do this? And it's a pain in the butt. I'm just telling you what I'm going to tell you is a pain in the butt. And again, it goes back to this balancing act of convenience versus security and safety. So why cyber hygiene? And the reason why we have cyber hygiene is to get before the bank. And, and that's what it is. And when I say the bang, what am I talking about? Uh, turn on the TV and you guys can tell me what I'm talking about. We're talking about ransomware. We're talking about encryption. We're talking about stolen information. We're talking about Equifax. We're talking about Target. We're talking about Home Depot. We're talking, I mean, you cannot turn on the, we're talking about Yahoo. You cannot turn on the TV and there hasn't been a major breach. And friends, it's not getting any better. And I will tell you, I always want to tell you, my husband before I got into this job, he was like, you know, you used to be a pretty positive person. <laughs> and it's not that I'm not positive and it's not that I'm, I'm fearful. The future is bright and it's amazing, but you just got to go into it with eyes wide open. And we're going to talk about things to help you protect yourself. Uh, but the bad guys are out there and, and they're sophisticated and they get paid a lot of money to do what they do. So you just got to, you know, we just, you got to be on the defense and we got to get on the other side of that. So why cyber hygiene? And it's because the target, quite frankly, is you. I mean, we're, we're all the target. I always tell people cyber hygiene is not a computer problem. I'll say that again. Cyber hygiene or cyber security and cyber is not a computer problem. It's a human problem. Um, it, it's your staff. It's you <laughs> that are clicking on the really bad email. So how do you kind of help that and you know help protect yourself? So what I'm going to talk about, and we'll kind of go through this kind of quickly, but the target is you, and it's how do the bad guys figure out who you are and how to get into your system? So here is scenario number one. So this is Keller Williams. Okay, so this is company. I could have put NAU up there. The hacker will go to the website, and every website has the staff in it. This all the staff and this what their jobs are and this is their pictures and their addresses and their names and I mean it just it gives all of this information. So they go to the website and then they find you. Okay. Next step that they do is they research you. We're all and I mean here's the deal, friends. We're all professionals. Every single person in here has a LinkedIn page. Most of you have a Facebook page. Most of you have a Twitter page. Most of you have an Instagram page. I mean that's just the world that we live in. And that is what I tell people from a standpoint of cybersecurity. If you want to be 100% cybersecure, open that window, grab your computer, throw it out, and grab your phone, and toss it right out of it. That is the only way that you will be 100% cybersecure. At the end of the day, friends, we're not going to do that because we're going to have all of these things. So they reach you on this LinkedIn and, face and Facebook page. They spoof an email from X, Y, and Z. So here's this gal. I was, it was very easy to find this gal named Ashley, okay? <laughs> and the email can come from Keller Williams. So the email can come to you from National University, okay? So the email comes to you from your headquarters. Um, there's an association that you guys belong to. And how do I know this? Because you have it on your LinkedIn page. <laughs> how do I know that you love the Broncos? Because you have it on your Facebook page. The Denver Broncos asking for payment. Things like this. So that's 
how they really start researching it. And you, got, you know what, you guys? It takes 20 minutes. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time to figure out who you are. It doesn't take a lot of time to go grab your company logo, paste it to the top of an email. It doesn't take any time to create a domain, you know, an email, a Jen Ferda at NAU. And that's the thing, one of the, what we'll talk about in the cyber hygiene is I can change one word, your eyes aren't gonna catch it. So if I misspell university, mm -hmm. and you know, you're not gonna see it. You're gonna say, oh yeah, it's NAU. So that is how they start to dig in, research who you are and how to get to you. So um, scenario number two, they break into your email, okay? And we all have our name, our phone number, our emails, et cetera, et cetera. We're so easily accessible. They then, and how they, and that could be, that's a whole other training that we can do is, you know, how, who are the hackers? What are they doing? What are they after? And how are they getting into your system? But they get in and they can start sending emails. So what happens is the email comes from your boss saying, hey, um, we need to, we're going to sponsor this event. We need to give them $1,500 because we're going to sponsor the first responders training. Can you go ahead and send them that money right now? And you're like, 1500 bucks came from my boss? Yeah, I'm going to do what my boss says. So you send it. So <laughs> they get in, they can start receiving emails, sending your emails, um, create a very convincing email that they know who you are. You're talking about Joey's soccer game. And then, you know, the next email that comes from us, hey, how was Joey's soccer game this weekend? So, I mean, it looks completely legit and you don't think anything different than your boss saying, hey, we're going to sponsor the first responders cyber training. So it's just, it's just being diligent. Scenario th number three, hacker sends a phishing email. Obviously this was for, we had a training for uh, brokers. But sends a phishing email, requests action for you. Hey, can you log in? And it's going to have the NAU logo or whatever you belong to. And, you know, your username, your password. You're going to say, can you go ahead and log in here? And you're going to say, go ahead. Yeah, that looks to totally legit. Now they have your username. Now they have your password. All of these things. And you're going in there and you're clicking. And, you know, it could be, you know, it's where they're going to download the malware. Or now they're getting into your system. This is how they ferret it into your system. Uh, wire fraud emails. So I will tell you wire fraud is a gigantic issue. And I don't, you guys don't do wire fraud when people are paying for school and things like that. Is that, that's not how you're getting. So from a standpoint of the real estate business from what this training was, wire fraud is a big deal. So when I was saying that the bad guys are intercepting the email, so it would literally go good guy to good guy. Hey, hey, so excited. Congratulations on your house. We're going to do the wire transfer. Let me know when you're ready. Bad guy goes in right in that moment, cut you out so you don't see any of the email traffic. And the bad guy goes, oh, you know what? Um, instead of going to Wells Fargo, uh, we're going to change it to U.S. Bank. Here's the routing number and all of these things. And I mean, it happens time and time and time again. So what they're saying from a standpoint of how do you catch this? You know, these are, these are real emails from the hacker to the real buyer, but it's from the fake closer. So you're telling, you know, telling people pay attention, you know, when we're doing wire fraud. And again, going back to the convenience versus safety and security. Convenience says, let's just get on email and let's just do this all in email. Security and safety says you can't go that fast anymore. And it has to be a, hi, Joe, are you ready to do the wire transfer? Okay. Here's where you send it to, and you know, and then they know who they're talking to and who the conversation is. So, you know, U.S. Bank talking to people. This wasn't the closing company's bank. This was the account name, not the closing company's name. Here was the account number, not the company's account. I mean, all of these ways that people could have caught this, and these are frauds that went through. <coughs> so, that. That is a little bit on how from a socially engineered attack, that's how they're kind of figuring out who you are, how to get your email, how to shoot you an email. And I will tell you one last story. So we were doing one of our trainings and prior to the training, you know, we knew everybody who was going to be in the room and it was a banker. And so what we did is we went onto his LinkedIn page and we found out that he was a big time cyclist. Okay. We created a website, it took us minutes to create kids for bikes. Okay. We set up the link and we did our, we started our email and we said, hi, Mr. Banker. Um, we, I'm starting a new nonprofit. It's called kids for bikes. 
I was wondering, do you mind, would you click on this, my, would you click on my website and can you just give me feedback about what you think of my website? And you know, and I know that you're an investment banker and we're looking, you know, we're looking at an investment bank and maybe you and I can talk about, you know, investment banking as well. Do you mind doing that? I just, I would appreciate some feedback. And we, and Greg <laughs> clicked on the account because he wanted to give feedback. Clearly we weren't the bad guys, so it wasn't full of malware or anything malicious, but it was just how easy. Uh, one thing, so when we're talking about jobs, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, phishing, there are companies who will send phishing emails out to your staff. So, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll rate your staff. And they'll say, okay, we send it to 100 people on your staff, 75% uh, of them click on the link. <laughs> you know, and then you will send all of your team <clears throat> yeah. to training. So you can get malware just by clicking on the link? Oh, you can get malware by going to websites. And what they'll do, it, it's the link mm -hmm. that is where the malware, that, that is, I'm going to tell you right now, the majority of any time somebody's getting into Equifax, they're getting into Target, they're getting into, you know, Home Depot, Yahoo, whatever, it's because somebody on staff mm -hmm. got a link and they clicked on it. That is 100%. So what happens is when you click on that link, they're downloading malware into your system mm -hmm. and now they're in your system. And there's different malware. It's, um, malware is just like software. So there, you know, how you have your Excel and your Word and your PowerPoint and this and the other, there's different malwares for different things. Um, just on Memorial Day weekend, we got a call from a local manufacturer. They have seven servers, okay? And they called and they said, hey, Jen, uh, we've been hacked into and they've encrypted all seven of our servers. Can you, uh, can we use your Bitcoin to pay him? A Bitcoin at the time is $4,500. And they wanted, you know, how do you, you know, one Bitcoin each to open up the servers. So that software that whoever downloaded on it, um, that is, so when we're talking jobs, one, there's one job. So there are companies that actually do phishing. So somebody has to do that. So those are jobs. The other one is cyber forensics. So there are companies. So the, the local manufacturer who will remain nameless, the local manufacturer, they hired a company to do cyber forensics to go in there to find out a how they got in, um, b you know wh where their holes were, you know where do they need to shore up, you know there's firewalls, there's jobs for companies for people to go in there and create firewalls and systems like that. So protection for you and your company, that's what we're going to talk about, and then we'll kind of wrap up with even more about jobs. This is where the importance of kind of doing that balancing act be between convenience and safety. So A, use a password on every single electronic device you own. Okay, that's number one. The part that's gonna be painful is changing a different password. Every single device you have needs to have a different password. And the reason is, and I was the worst culprit of this, the reason is if a bad guy gets one password, you don't want him to get them all. So, and it is, and you guys, it's a pain in the butt. I will tell you, so I got, there are a ton of password blockers out there. Um, my opinion is you get what you pay for. There are free password blockers out there. I have one, this is not a commercial for them. The one I use is OnePass. And within 30 days of me having OnePass, I had over a hundred different passwords. Every website you go to, you know, your Pandora has a different website or a different password. Your LinkedIn has a different password. Your Twitter has a different password. When you're signing your kids up for summer camp, that has a different password. I mean, just everything has to have a password. And if you do this, everything has a different password. So the first thing people say is, Jen, I can't remember all that. That's fine, get a password locker. Or if you have parents or grandparents and you're gonna go tell them, hey, you really need to have a different password for everything. I would not tell my grandparents or my parents to have a password locker. I would tell them, it down on a pad of paper, put it in a folder, put it in a secure place, and do not label the folder passwords. <laughs> if there's a bad guy who's in your house, one, you got bigger issues than your passwords, but two, you want to put it someplace that somebody just can't walk into. And if you write them down in your computer, you know, you don't want to name your documents important documents, classified documents, passwords. <laughs> you don't want to name your things because God forbid somebody gets in, they give you, they send you a phishing email, they get into your stuff and 
you know, they're, they're in your files and they're in your operating system, you don't, all they're going to do, they're just snooping around and at least make it a little bit harder for them because you might be able to detect them before they can get to the goodies. So always just kind of, and I know it's kind of cat and mouse and it's kind of sneaky, but, but so writing down your password. So that's rule number one is password protect every single one of your devices and everything that asks for a password, it has a different password. Uh, number one password, and I think this is starting to change, but this was, I think, in 2015, the number one password was password, and one, two, three, four. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, that so, was literally my worst password, but it had an exclamation point after. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> you changed it up a little. Never get into that one. So never, they never cracked that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> NIST, who is the National Institute of Science and Technology, they're kind of the, the compliance gurus. So this guy from NIST, he's the one who originally said it should be gobbledygook, should not make sense, and it's, you know, you should have capital letters, little letters, you should have symbols, you should have numbers, you know, to, to make it really hard. Well, then he came out with an article probably, I don't know, maybe 30 or 60 days ago. It's a pretty good article. And he comes out and he goes, sorry, you don't have to do that. You know, I mean, people are like pulling their hair out because password, you can never, you will never memorize uh, parentheses. X. Uh, you know, I mean, you'll just, you'll never memorize it. So here's what he said to do. He said, use four words together that don't make sense. So flag, clock, carpet, shoot. Four words whoops, that just absolutely do not make sense. I would still add capital letters, little letters, numbers, and symbols from an added safety. But what he is saying is the longer your passwords are, the better. A 20 character password could take years to decode, even if they have computer systems where they're decoding it for you. It could take years. So 20 characters could take years to decode. So just the longer, the better. Um, it's good, and here's, here's another one of those pain in the butt things. Even with the password locker and even writing down your passwords and everybody has a different password, it's still good to change your passwords at least once a year. Uh, reason being, bad guy gets into your system. He's got your password, he's got your username, all that good stuff, and he's just sitting there. And they're patient, friends. These bad guys are patient, especially depending on who you are and what you do. And if you have access to money or you have access to bank accounts, they're, they're just insane. And you're never going to know that they're even there. If you change your passwords once a year, if they're in there and now you change your password, they can't get back in there. So changing your passwords, my, my rule of thumb is at least once a year because, you know, I, I change all my passwords and all that good stuff. Other people will say change them once a quarter. Some people will say change them once a month. You know, I think once a week. I mean, now, you know, and that's, that's what happened is everybody said, you know, we all remember when it was, you got to change your password, you know, once a quarter, and then your admin system would flip up on your computer and say, time to change your password. And so you would change your password from one, two, three, four to one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> you know, I'd add the, the, the exclamation point. <laughs> but what we did is we, we, we made people simplify it too much. We made it too stupid. So people, because they got too aggravated because they got tired of trying to memorize everything. So that's why I say once a year, um, you, you know, you can do it more, um, but I would do it at least once a year. Um, do not, here's another one of the pain about things. Do not let the internet save your password. It's so easy when you're on there and it says, Hey, would you like Google Chrome to save your passwords? Yeah. The answer that you want every time is no, not ever. Okay. You do not want, um, it to save your passwords because again, if the bad guys are in your system or somebody's in on the other end of your Google Chrome, they now have your password and everything. So do not ever let the system save your passwords. I know, no, 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 no. I, I promise you, you're going back and you're clearing out all this stuff. And here's the deal: it's a pain in the butt. Guess what else I'm going to tell you? Clear your cookies. Let's talk about that one. So every time you go into Pandora, every time you go into Facebook, every time you go in somewhere, normally you would just open it up and it would pop up and there you go and away you go. No, I am telling you every time you gotta go in there and go Pandora.com. Here's my password. It, it, it just, it's the convenience thing. Two-factor authentication, I highly encourage you anytime that is available. Uh, if a bad guy is in your Gmail account or something like that and you're going in there and you have to do two-factor, 
That guy's probably not looking over your shoulder. That guy probably doesn't have your cell phone. So just adding this is an extra state and you know, and have them text you the number. So that's two factor authentication. The longer, the better. 20 characters can take years. Uh, phishing. Okay. So this is what we were talking about. When you ask specifically, you know, can I, can I get a bad one just by clicking on a link? So there are companies, um, I think it might be level three. So level three does phishing on their employees all the time. I mean, level three is a cyber company and they do the fiber and all that good stuff. And so they see who will click on the link or not. And if you click on the link, you kind of get this big giant, we told you not to click on links. And now you have to go to the fishing, to the pond, they call it. And you have to go to like training. <laughs> and every time you click on the link, you have to go back to training and you have to go to the pond and you know, you get embarrassed and all that good stuff. But what fishing is, but here's the deal. What I was showing you earlier is it's, it's scary because somebody could have gone to your Facebook and they know that you're going to the Bronco game Sunday night. And they know you're super excited about it because you put it on Facebook that you're so excited because you got tickets to the Bronco game. Well, now they can send an email from the Broncos and they can say, Hey, lucky you, we're going to upgrade your seats. Just need you to click here and give us the last four of your social security number. You know what I'm saying? And you're so excited to go to the Bronco game. Of course you're going to click on it because you want better seats. So just being careful of these phishing, it's just, it's the phishing emails and they're getting better and better. Paying attention to emails. So not clicking on websites or opening documents from someone you do not know, which is number one, or number two is unsolicited. If you didn't ask for the better Bronco tickets, and if it's too good to be true, pay attention. I mean, that, that, that hasn't changed. If something is too good to be true, pay attention to it. Uh, here's an interesting one. I don't know how I get on the numerous um, newsletters or little daily snippets or whatever. I don't know how I get on them. Do not ever click unsubscribe me because that could be the bad link. What you do is you just you block them. And you, so you go into your back part, back in and you say, this is junk mail and you block them. Do not ever click on unsubscribe buttons. Hovering over a link to make sure that it's legit. If I know, I know if um, Apple, most of us have Apple phones. Um, if Apple is going to send you an email the email and the link are going to have Apple somewhere in it. It's not going to be generic link. So if you hover over links, you can look and see, and if it doesn't make sense, don't click on it. I'm looking at the email addresses. I was saying this earlier. So what will happen is NAU, what is your, what's the last half of your email? Uh, national.edu. National.edu. Okay. So national.edu, I can just flip the I and the O. And you guys won't notice that because you're so used to seeing a national. You're just going to go right up. So looking to make sure that things are legitimate. And that's what they'll do is they'll just, or something, um, it'll be uh, nationals, you know, and they'll just add an S or, you know, or they'll, or if something has an S at the end of it, they'll just take the S off. So always pay, looking at the email addresses that it comes from to make sure that they are actually email addresses. Social engineering attack, these are attacks that rely on human interaction and it involves tricking people into breaking kind of their normal security procedures. Information gathering, I go to your website, I find out who you are, I get in there, maybe I start emailing you, asking about Joey's game, and then, you know, now I'm saying, hey, um, there's this awesome soccer camp. I think, do you think Joey would want to go to the soccer camp? You know, and then they're getting into your system. So socially engineered tax or the other ones that are happening, um, CEO sends email to CFO and says, hey, we need to pay XYZ invoice, it's $10,000, please do that ASAP. Well, you don't want to tick off the CEO, so CFO does it. Part of it is setting up policies and procedures within your systems. So a policy and procedure could be, we never transfer money without looking each other in the eye. We never transfer money over five hundred, you know, five thousand dollars or whatever. CFOs were getting fired because they were making these payments. And then once the money's gone, the money's gone. And you know, and it's not necessarily you can't say, well, well but the email came from you. You know, the email didn't come from the CEO. So socially engineered attacks. Um okay, social media. This is one especially anybody in here have kiddos? So this is one for your kiddos and this is for you as well. 
leaving something to the imagination. We do not need to know every detail of your life because if you're putting it out there, not only are your friends and family seeing it, bad guys are seeing it too. Never ever put your date of birth on social media. Never ever put your address, your phone number. Answers to common security questions. You know, if you're talking about your new car, your high school sports, things like that, your grandma, you know, your kids' names, you're kind of putting security question answers out there. So just leaving something to the imagination. Um, Location-based check-ins. I don't know how many of you have kids that have Snapchat. Um, I would encourage you, tell your children to put it in ghost mode. Um, people can follow you around. When everybody says, oh, I'm, in, I'm on a plane, I'm in DIA, and I'm going to Italy for two weeks, woo! You're letting everybody else know that you're not going to be home. That's not a cyber thing. Um, but just, you know, don't, don't checking in because everybody else is knowing what you're checking for. Top five, social media attacks, chain letters. Um, if you don't send this, you know, or I want five roses, send this chain letter. If you don't send this, you're going to have 10 years of bad luck. Here's the deal. One, the, they're back and they're out there and they're circulating and here's the deal. These chain letters can be laced with malware. And what happens, there was a Twitter, a tweet, a twit. The kid <laughs> put it out there and it was bad stuff, but because it was so like shock and awe, everybody was forwarding and everybody was clicking on it. And it, this virus just spread like wildfire and it was misinformation. I mean, that's, that's kind of the form of a, a chain letter. The cash grabs, we all know this. You know, you just, you friend somebody because they're cute on Facebook or wherever. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, can I borrow some money from you? But this is, that's the number four social media attack. <laughs> number three, <laughs> hidden charges. Yeah. What type of Star Wars character are you or what, you know, what, what, what tree are you, or what, you know, take this quiz and find out and then let your friends know. And then the next thing you know, you just got charged $10 every month because you clicked on the link and you took the survey. And you, I mean, it just, I mean, these are the things that are out there. Number two, phishing requests. This one was my favorite because I promise you, if somebody sent this to me, I would totally click on it. <laughs> Somebody just put pictures of you drunk at this wild party. Oh. <laughs> you better look at them. So you're like, oh my god! You know? <laughs> so you're clicking on it, and it takes you, you know, I mean, it's fake or it's malware, or things like that. And then here's the number one <laughs> social media attack. Beware of blindly clicking on short URLs. They're malware hotspots. Yeah. So just making sure. And it used to be, and I, and I have to tell you, it used to be you could copy it and then pull it into your um, your search, you know, into your Google or any, into your browser, and that's just not the case anymore. Once you, once you click on it, you click on it, and it's in your system. So it's not even, it's not even safe. Just put it. So it's just again, if you do not know the person, and I will tell you, call people. I've called people before where I've seen something. I'm like, hey, is this legit? You know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it normally is or resumes. That's another one. That's a hot spot that's starting to come down as people are saying, hey. This is my buddy. He's just moved to Colorado Springs. Does anybody know anybody hiring a mechanical engineer? Will you check out his resume? And they're bad. So you call your buddy up and you just say, hey, did you really just send me John's resume? Yes or no? So those are things and it just unsolicited and people you don't know are, are the two things. And you know what? Here's the, I know this is an old fashioned idea, but instead of uh, checking emails, why don't you get out of your office and walk to the next office over and have the conversation? <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, 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 that is, I mean, just, you know, the old art of conversation, not doing everything on emails. Updates. So here's my favorite one. If you hear nothing else I say today, listen to this one. Updates. Prior to me getting the job at the NCC, I was a self-proclaimed, I hate updates. I will never do them because you screw up your phone. You can never find contacts again. I lost my flashlight. And it just doesn't look how I just learned how to use the other one. But. Updates are so insanely important because what's happening on these updates, so your Google Chrome, these updates, Chrome finds, they have a hole. They have a vulnerability and they find it and they update it and you need to download and do the new update. They might be adding some new little tips and tricks. The, the really bad one, the rotten water cry that just came down and really hammered the UK. 
<clears throat> the Microsoft was that it was the system that got attacked. Um, one, so many people had Microsoft systems that were out of date and they weren't even doing updates anymore. That was number one. And I mean, and it sucks. I mean, what I'm telling you is always have the most up to date equipment and up to date software and up to date everything. Two, Microsoft had the patch. It sent out the patch update <coughs> two weeks prior to WannaCry. And if people would have done their updates, they would not have had the, the, the system overload and the system error that they did. So running updates. Uh, one thing, and we talk about this at the end, please go and like NCC on our Facebook. Um, we have a Twitter and we have a LinkedIn. We get warnings, and I we've gotten huge compliments on this. We get warnings from the FBI. Um, there's multi-state ISACs that we're a part of, and they send us and they say, hey, we found a vulnerability in Google Chrome. Hey, we found a vulnerability in Foxfire. Hey, we found a vulnerability in Adobe. We found a vulnerability in Apple Watches. I mean, it's every single day I am putting updates up on our website that say, hey, somebody found a vulnerability in X, Y, and Z. And the number one recommendation is run your update because they are correcting, the, they're patching it. So again, if you hear nothing else, please do that. Virtually private networks, VPNs, um, I highly encourage the VPN basically creates a tunnel between your computer and the server and where you're going so that nobody can see in what you're talking about. So using VPNs, especially if you are not in your office, if you're out doing business, things like that, I highly, highly recommend that you do VPNs. Um, what are you saying yes to on your apps? We all get new apps, especially if you have kids. They're, they're downloading new apps on your phone like every second. Yeah. Please read what you are saying yes to. Um, does your fridge really need Wi-Fi? Does your flashlight need access to your contacts, your mic, and your photos? Probably not. So if an app that you are trying to download and it says, hey, can we have access to your contacts? No, the answer is no, you don't need the app. So just really, really paying attention to what apps you're doing. Here's another, this one's a tough one, and I'm probably gonna do this this weekend. Deleting old apps. If you no longer use it or need it, get rid of it. Because if you're not paying attention to it and it's just sitting on your phone, you're not running updates on it, you're not paying attention to what's going on out there, delete it. Delete games your kids aren't playing, delete games you're not playing anymore. Just get it off of your phone, get it off of your computer. If you are not using it and no longer need it, get rid of it because those are where the bad guys are getting in because you're not updating it and they're old. So delete those. Uh, public computers, again, I don't know that this is much of an issue as much anymore just because everybody has their own computers. Do not use kiosks, public computers. Uh, think hotel business centers, especially with sensitive information, credit cards, you're checking into, your, you're getting your airline, you know, you're checking into your plane from the hotel. Um, just assume that other people are watching you, especially on those public computers. So just not even using them or, you know, you, I guess using your VPN if you can, if you can do that. Open Wi-Fi, do not use public or open Wi-Fi, period. Mm -hmm. It is unsecure. And again, just assuming that people are watching you. You need to go into your laptops that you take out and about when you're meeting people at coffee shops. You need to go into your phone and you need to clear. You need to go into where, you need to go into your settings and you need to go into your open Wi-Fi spots and you need to clear every open Wi-Fi your phone or your computer has ever clicked into. Convenience versus safety and security. Your phone <laughs> is trying to be smart and your phone is trying to help you and your phone is always looking for a hot spot. Your phone is always looking for a Wi-Fi because it wants to help you. It wants to make your phone go better. Well, what's happening is it's opening and it's clicking into open Wi-Fi. Now, I will tell you, we've done another training where a gentleman walks in. He always comes into the training about an hour early. He always comes into the training about an hour early. And um, he has rabbit ears. And it's a little pie. And he sets it up. And he opens. So we're at NAU. So he's going to open. Your Wi-Fi was called National American University, whatever, whatever. Well, he's going to open one up and he's going to call it NAU. And he's going to have the strongest signal because he's sitting there. And then he waits. And then he goes in and he does his, he does his session. And then he opens up the screen, the live screen. And he sees how many people click on the NAU. 
and I'm every time, every time it's about 50%. And your phone is just doing it because it's grabbing the largest, the strongest, the strength. So when you are in Starbucks and you need Wi-Fi, do not click on the open Starbucks Wi-Fi. Do not click on the Xfinity Wi-Fi. Do not click on any of the open Wi-Fis. I have to tell you, um, the free virus is here. I was at Loyal's Coffee here in Colorado Springs and I needed to get on the Wi-Fi and I was just looking to see, because some of the Wi-Fi names are hysterical names. Right there, that was the one I found. Free virus is here. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Solution to that, they have Jetpacks, uh, Sprint, ATT, everybody, whoever your phone service is, they have something just called little Jetpacks, and they're personal and they're secure Wi-Fi. Yeah. It's, it's a Jetpack. Um, go, who's your phone carrier? Like hot, hot, yeah, yeah, it's a hot yeah. spot. but it's a little, it's a physical, it literally is about the size of this. Um, and you can, other people can log in into it, but it gives you a super secure, you know, here's the deal. The little jetpack costs probably maybe a hundred bucks. And then there's kind of, you know, there's the, yeah, there's it's, yeah, exactly. But if you, you know, if you're out and about, especially for people who are not in the office, especially for people who are out and about, and that, because that is where your job takes you, getting those jack, jet packs will be a lifesaver. Um, Bluetooth, the newest virus out there is called Blueborn. Um, the solution to this is turning off Bluetooth when it is not in use. I will promise you right now, 50% of us, my Bluetooth is probably on right now. Especially, yes, the newest. Nope, this is, this is the new one. Especially on IoT equipment. So Bluetooth, this, has Bluetooth on it because it has to connect. Uh, phones, computers, mouses, keyboards, radios. Uh, it's called Blue. It's called Blueborn. Searches for Bluetooth connections and it finds vulnerabilities and it just gets in there and it starts pinging you. And it pings you. And it pings you. And it pings you. So Bluetooth. Turning off your Bluetooth and not using it. USBs. This is a no-brainer. Um, do not only use USBs. Um, here's the story. Outside of an aerospace DOD company, bad guys had USBs and they would just leave them on the ground. So people would pick them up and be like, oh, five gigs. I totally need this. Throw them into their computer because it was a new, it's a free USB and then it was oh, yeah. low to a malware and they got into their system. So I mean, just only using USBs. And I will tell you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say, you know, when you look at Here's your state actors. When I say state actors, these are states that employ bad guys. Russia, China, North Korea, Kazakhstan, Iran. I honestly, I don't know that I would use a USB that was made in any of those countries. So just, it, you know, it's just being really, really mindful of. Um, so yeah. yeah. So they have they have proof that um, companies in China they're loading their sticks with malware. And it's not even malware; it's spyware. Now, and I will tell you what's so bad about this. And again, it's get before the bang spyware. Um, you um, U.S. Steel. China was able to get into the U.S. steel market because they were stealing trade secrets and they were able to sell steel at nothing and it bankrupt all of the U.S. steel companies. Wow. Because they were spying on the companies and they just knew where to go and who to talk to and they knew who to sell the steel to. Um, planes, we just, Boeing, just unleashed, you know, it's brand new fighter jet week later, it cost them billions of dollars to make. Week later, China said, look at our new jet. And it was the exact same thing, and it was fine. They were spying on them. So yes, so USB, flash drives, things like that. And again, it's just paying attention. Backups, here's another, muy importante. The manufacturer that we talked about earlier called me up, said, Jen, uh, they locked down seven of our servers. Next question out of my mouth was, well, surely you have backup, so who cares if they lock your stuff out? Just go get your backup. Uh, Jen, we thought we had backups, but uh, <laughs> they're six months old. We wow. said, oh, that hurts. So backups, I will tell you, I use my little flash drive, and every Friday afternoon, I put it into my computer, and I download it, and I save all my documents and all that good stuff. And the reason why you do that, if the bad guys come in, and one day you open up your computer, and it has a laughing skull going, ha, 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 ha. I've just encrypted your machine. Pay me money. 
you can say, you know what? Stick that where the sun don't shine. You either close the laptop and deep six it, or you go and get it wiped, and you're back in business within hours versus days, weeks, months. Um, the good rule of thumb is to have one physical backup, kind of you know, on your disk or you know, on your flash drive, and then one cloud backup. There is a huge myth out there that the cloud is is uh, nobody can break into the cloud. That no, the, the cloud is not. It's it's no more safe or unsafe as anything else. So um, that is why you want to do backups. Um, other cyber tips: disabling cookies. So going into your get into your operating systems and disabling your cookies because cookies can be bad. Disabling um, using ad blockers. Um, know your vendors. What are their cybersecurity policies? Target. The only reason why Target got hacked into it was through their HVAC company. So, what are their cybersecurity companies? So, knowing who you're who you're doing business with and how are they protecting their company and your data, uh, protecting your information. Does every form need your social security on it? Uh, the answer is no. Where is your data stored at your doctor's office? How many times? I mean, I've walked into offices where people have had sensitive information just sitting on students. I mean, you guys have to get all of your student information. Where are you storing that data? I will tell you, and I'm not going to say the right name, GPRN, it's in the UK. So we kind of have NIST 800-171, which is the compliance piece of cyber. Um, the UK, they, as of January 1st of 2018, they, you cannot do business in the UK if you are not compliant, but the biggest piece of compliance is if you as a company store data, names, phone numbers, birthdays, social security numbers, whatever, the onus is on you to protect that data. So when you're talking about your students, these are jobs for your students. So, but just protecting your information, policy, uh, company hygiene, training your staff, uh, I think it's, you know, I mean, so many, you didn't realize even just clicking on an email, that's how they download the malware and that's it. So training your staff so they understand and they don't just go start clicking on every email that they get. Controlling access, this is a policy one. Controlling access, does every single person on your staff need access to every single data or file? If they don't, that's good. If, you know, if you don't need access to everything and they got into your system, but they only got to the next level, okay. You know, but does everybody need to have the access that you have? Probably not. So locking that down when we talk about jobs, you know, from the IT perspective, those are jobs that people can go in there and say, okay, you get access to everything, you get access to this one piece because that's what you need. So does everybody need that access? Um, classifying data and, and encrypting um, sensitive information, you know, I mean, if you have social security numbers, you know, it, it's crazy. It's harder to break into your phone than it is to get somebody's social security number. So encrypting that kind of data, again, from a job perspective, there are companies out there that will do that for you. This is an important one. Having two people who know and have access to all company usernames and passwords. I will tell you there was a university, not going to tell you who, that had their IT dude um, 20 years. Okay, Rick, Bob and IT was there forever. Uh, Bob and IT got ticked off and disgruntled and they said, Bob, uh, it's time for you to find another occupation. And Bob and IT said, okay. And he locked them out of all their stuff and he was the only one that had access to it. So that's bad juju. So company policy, having two people know all company username and passwords, um, know every device that employees are using. So whether it's their device or your device, just kind of knowing what those devices are. Testing your staff, doing, you know, doing the, the phishing email, and then you go back and you say, okay, 75% of the staff failed. Okay, let's do a training. Then you test them again in 30 days. Okay, 50% of your staff failed. You do a training. You know, and you just kind of keep whittling that down. Having an incident response plan, this is pretty important from a standpoint of it's not an if, but a plan. Um, there is no such thing as companies that are too small to be hacked. Um, there's no such, there's no sacred cows. I would tell you what I think the one sacred cow was is healthcare. Because healthcare doesn't care if you're a rotten person or not, they're there to help you. And the wanna cry, that's all it did was attack healthcare. I mean, people, who knows how many people either died or suffered needlessly because the hospitals, their entire systems, they couldn't get into them. So having an incident response plan uh, because it is going to happen. Who's your legal help? Who do you want to do your forensics? What about your remediations? 
cyber insurance, that is the thing. Communications to staff, to clients, to media. Who's gonna do that? What is your communication? Who's in charge in case there's a cyber event? You know, you don't, is, that, is it you? I mean, or is it your ID person? But everybody needs to know who that is. This is a big one. Knowing your crown jewels and your critical systems and how you protect them. What, if something were to go down, what would take the university down? And whatever that is, you better be protecting it, you better be encrypting it, and you better know what those are, and you better be knowing how to get the walls around them. Um, company policy, and this is hard, I would not allow employees to use your company email for private use. Um, because, you know, I mean, if they use their Gmail account, that's fine, that's their Gmail account, but they can't get to the mother load, which is the company. So that would be a company policy. Who's the person you tell when something's fishy? Who's the person that you tell, like, man, it's taken me a really long time to get into the internet. What's going on? Who do you tell that to? <laughs> okay, well, good. You guys know the name. Uh, firewall, virus protection. I mean, that, that's kind of basic stuff. Um, the one right now, I don't know, is the, uh, the Microsoft Defender. What are, what are <laughs> comes on your computer? Windows Defender. Windows Defender. That is every single, uh, all of our cyber experts tell me that that is by far and away the best. But here's what's interesting. So let's say you go and you say, I'm going to use McAfee. McAfee will go into your system and disable the defender to put in their own stuff. So be really mindful of that because the defender, the one that comes with the operating system, is the best one out there. Um, scanning your system regularly. There are companies and IE people that need to do this. Cyber insurance. Um, what cyber insurance does is, God forbid, but somebody gets into your system, you know, you can get a million dollar policy for 700 bucks a year. And it will, it will, anything that, any cash outlay or any money that is stolen, it will help recoup those costs. Knowing what your quote unquote normal is. So this is Gary. So the state of Colorado, their firewall gets hit by 100 million times a day a day now not all of it is malicious some of it's fat fingers and somebody just they're you know they typed in the wrong password and have to go back you know but 500 million times a day that's their norm so they know that now they know if it goes up to a billion we got an issue somebody's trying to get into our system and they know kind of get on higher alert your company one hit a day could be out of the norm. 10 hits out of the day, or 10 hits could be normal, but if you go up to 20, that's double, that, that's double it. So knowing what is your norm. So cyber fatigue, you know the risks, you know the solutions, but you still go to Starbucks and say, but I really want this song, so I'm gonna click on it anyways. Um, I always tell people, here's what the bad guys are doing. <clears throat> the bad guys are going up and down the street and they're checking for open car doors, and they're checking for open doors. If you make it just 10 minutes harder on the bad guy, they're going to go on to the next one because I promise you there is a next one. Um, and there's another easier target out there. Unfortunately, and we tell people this, if the bad guys want to get in, they're going to get in. But the more you know and the safer you are, the better you are you know, protecting your, your company. But yeah, it's the, you don't have to be cyber perfect, but the turning bad guy for a few minutes can keep you in the clear. You just have to outrun the slowest guy in the group. So um, definitely staying connected. You know, we are, we do have the Facebook page. We do have a Twitter page. We do have a LinkedIn page. The Facebook page, and I will tell you, the Facebook page we update all the time. Um, if there's multiple threats in a day, I will put those on Facebook, but I'll only do the one a day on, on um, LinkedIn and I'll only do the one a day on Twitter. But Facebook, I'll do them. If there's multiple of them, I'll throw them up on Facebook. So just kind of paying attention to that, that will kind of, help you. So there's my contact info. Now, uh, I know it's three o'clock, but let's talk really quick about students. Um, I know one of your students had a question about internships and then just other jobs. So there are, you know, everything that I kind of talked about today, there, if there, there's a bad part of it, there's a good part of it. Even ethical hacking. You know, I mean, there are there 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 are companies out there that need ethical hacking. So white hat versus black hat. One hundred percent. That's exactly what it is. Um, 
So one of the questions from one of the students was about internships and needing uh, security clearance. Here is my recommendation to high school students. I, and I always tell them, you know, if you are gonna go into cyber, there are a lot of companies that do need you to have a cyber clearance. So I always encourage them, don't do really dumb things that could damage you for forever. Now, I know a lot of your students are adults and they've already done their dumb things. So here, here's what I will say. So two stories to this. One, SAIC, who is a local aerospace DOD company, they are hiring 40 software developers every day. They can't, they can't get them, they can't keep them. Um, what they are running into right now, and these are good jobs. These are not chump change jobs. They cannot find young professionals who can get or keep a security clearance. And here's what here's what the problem is. It, it's it's drugs, it's pot. It's, yeah. You know, um, it's and it's not. And listen to me. So if you have students that say, "Man, I smoked pot when I was 18," that's fine. When they're going to the security clearance, admit it. I smoked pot. I had a DUI. I did this. I did that. You know, I was stupid. Whatever. Admit it. Just get it right out there. Because if you're willing to admit it, nobody can hold it over your head and say, hey, you better give me that sensitive information or I'm going to tell everybody you had a DUI when you were 18. Just get it out on the table. However, with the drugs and the pot and all that good stuff, you have to stop. <laughs> you cannot continue to do it. And people, they're just young professionals now are kind of like, no, this is my lifestyle. This is what I want to do and I'm not going to stop. So it is crazy. So now in the case of what this question was from a standpoint of, hey, I really want to do an internship, but, they, but I need a security clearance for this place. What I would do if, for your students is they need to go and approach these companies, whether it's the Vocors or whoever the aerospace DOD, because that's who's going to need the security clearances, and ask them, can we start to build a relationship and will you be my sponsor of this security clearance? Because you can't just go get a security clearance just because you want just because you want one. There has to be something tied to it. So telling your students, you know, yes, and I mean, having the security clearance, and I know, again, I know a lot of your students are military, highly, highly encourage your, your students that have the security clearances, keep them up to date. I can't tell you how many people just said, I let it lapse. Don't let it lapse. Because you never know when you're going to need it. So just, that would be one on that. So on it's the whole pretty internet. difficult. I mean, how, what's the likelihood of getting the security clearance if you're not correct? Like, are they investing in people who don't have security clearances? Oh, sure, because you can get a security clearance and not be military. Yeah. Absolutely. What? Oh, yeah. And it, was he ever military? No, no. So yeah. you can get the security clearance. What I'm saying is you can't just, you can't come in and say, you know what? I want a security clearance. Yeah. You have to be tied to your project, to the company. Yeah. So you got to get that sponsor. I want to see yeah. that. We just we had another presenter who said that they're not even touching people who don't have clearances because they want to. <coughs> you know, but then it seems. I, I know that that's not true. I mean, you have somebody sitting in here that. Yeah. And I know, and I will also tell you. So I have a friend of mine who has a security clearance, and I was one of their. You have to get interviewed for the security lines, um, they were dumb and they got a DUI and it was a very public DUI. And, um, but I think, the, I think the story to your students are even if you did something incredibly stupid, own it, you know, stay clear, get it, figure out, you know, yeah. clear up your reputation and then you can get one. Um, most, I mean, and it's not necessarily military, they're um, working in aerospace and DOD. So yes. most people, if they're getting a security clearance, it's because they're working in the military. Yeah. It's not necessarily that they have to be military. Right. I mean, his dad's a key example of that. Yeah. He works with DOD. Of course, right. That's what I'm saying is that you're going to be somewhere in DOD aerospace right. to need the security clearance because I mean that's who we that's who we yeah. want. So, any other questions about cyber industry? Okay, let's talk about our data really yeah. quick. So we were researching this before this class because there are so many unfilled jobs in cyber. And what were some of those numbers? Yeah, so a recent report from Cisco puts the global figure of cyber, cyber security job openings at 1 million, with demand expected to rise to 6 million by 2019. 
Wow. So your students who are in cyber right now, that is good. I would highly recommend to them um, doing these internships. I know one of you know the areas of just being an out and about and being around it. Um, there are chapters, especially for the women, in your classes. It's called Women in Security, W-I-S. Uh, there are local chapters, um, I-S-S-A, Security, International Security, I-S-S-A. Look it up. Uh, yeah, I-S-S-A, you know, there's chapters in Denver, there's chapters in the Springs. Colorado Tech Association is here in Colorado. So people just have to do really kind of uh, two minutes of research and you will find cyber groups. Um, you know, there are capture the flag games all the time. There is cyber patriot. There is, you know, there's, there's meetups. There's things like this that I would highly encourage your students to get involved in and get around and be around. Cyber moves so fast. A class that you were teaching 24 months ago is can be obsolete yeah. right now. Which, I mean, from your guys' standpoint, the beauty for you guys is you guys can move pretty quick. And you guys can kind of turn on the dime and say, hey, we want to teach pen testing now because there's, there's a need for penetration testing. You guys can do that. Yeah. Um, so, and that's good. So, any other questions? Cyber, cyber data? Awesome. Change your password. Yeah. Change yeah. Yeah. company policy. Don't be clicking on the links. Change, don't be clicking on the links. Change your password. Don't worry, see my Yeah, disable cookie. There you go, friends. Thank you. Thank you. I hope this is helpful. Very helpful. Good. I'll change my